print email Facebook Twitter more going tropo, is there evidence that madness in the tropics is actually a thing? It's the middle of October in the top end, the season also known as the build up, the harsh sun glares down from on high and the humidity is so thick you can almost see it, but there's not a cloud in the sky and no sign of relief, and there won't be for months. You're angry, irritable, and feel as though the tiniest thing might send you into a frenzy. As any resident of the tropics will tell you, these are the symptoms of going tropo. This investigation is part of Curious Darwin, our series where you ask us the questions, vote for your favorite, and we investigate. You can submit your question or vote on our next topic here. Melvin Linton, originally from England, wrote to us wanting to know if there was any truth to the condition. I came to Perth in 1980 and was warned about the danger of going tropo up north within a week of arrival, he said. For an impressionable young pom, the dangers of Australia were known to me, snakes, crocodiles, sharks, redbacks, drop bears, but this sounded more sinister, something that could affect your well-being, contagious, maybe incurable. How was it transmitted? What's the evidence? Are you actually losing it during the constant, oppressive, humid heat, or does it just feel like it? There is science behind the madness, reckons Dr. Mary Morris, a senior psychology lecturer at Charles Darwin University. I think going tropo is a real thing, she said. Whether it's a collection of symptoms, whether it's a syndrome, how it manifests in different people depends on a whole lot of things. There's no question that people can feel it. Research co-conducted by Dr. Morris has linked tropical heat with a range of physical and mental ailments. They feel different moods, and they feel different levels of depression, anxiety, stress, things like that, Dr. Morris said. You do behave differently, and you're more depressed, and you've got less energy, and you're sadder. Life is just really tough. Tropical summers equals northern winters. Dr. Morris doesn't believe going tropo is an actual disorder, but rather a collection of behaviors and emotions influenced by heat. In fact, research has found these seasonal symptoms are similar to those shown in people experiencing northern winters with sunless days. If you look at what happens with sleep deprivation, then you can see how some of that are the symptoms of going tropo, she said. It's the same symptoms for a different reason. Up north when you've got no sun and it's cold and it's miserable, people get depressed. Heat hangovers? You bet thermal physiologist Dr. Matt Braley also believes there's a case to argue for going tropo. Not based on anecdotal evidence, but based upon the science, he said. Dr. Braley works with tradies, teaching them how to keep cool while they're working in the top end heat. We see a change in both the response of workers to heat at work, and their responses in the home environment during the October to April, wet, season, he said. Dr. Braley said workers' sleep patterns, appetites, relationships, and hobbies were all affected by continual exposure to high humidity and temperatures. To add insult to injury, heat-related stress has even been found to cause heat hangovers. Day by day, being exposed to the heat has an effect on workers, he said. And we start to see these symptoms like an alcoholic hangover but it's due to heat, so they have the nausea, headache, loss of appetite, and general lethargy. Going tropo a hot topic so it would seem the phenomenon of going tropo isn't just a territory tall tale. But where did the term come from? The earliest evidence of use of the word tropo can be traced back to 1941, said Dr. Amanda Laugerson, director of the Australian National Dictionary Centre, ANDC. It was used to refer to someone who's mentally disturbed. As a result of spending too much time in the tropics, she said. According to Dr. Laugerson, the word was widely used by Australian troops serving in the Pacific. With troops being stationed both in the north of Australia and in the Pacific, they were having that experience more often than not, she said. It was a handy term for them to be using. Made for Darwin. In Darwin the term first appeared in a Darwin publication called Army News, Dr. Laugerson said, and became very popular very quickly. There's quite a lot of discussion in 1942 if you look at contemporary newspapers. They sort of refer to the Darwin boys as having coined this term, she said. The first evidence is from 1941, and then in 1942 everyone is talking about it. So, from 1942 there's evidence for the phrase go tropo, gone tropo, going tropo, and continues right through to today. Dr. Lauderson said the lack of earlier evidence means it's quite possible the Australian Imperial Force soldiers in Darwin were behind the term. I think the idea is that they were bored, they were hot, they were tired of being there, they were going a bit tropo, 
she said, despite the term's earlier origins, it's now used in a much broader sense. Advertisements saying, go tropo, buy a holiday to Queensland, or add something to your menu, go tropo and add something that reminds you of the tropics, she said. And also, the idea of just going a bit wild, a bit crazy, is definitely a connotation that's evolved in the years since World War II. Our question asker, Melvin Minturn, said he was particularly interested in the history of the phenomenon, and in light of the new evidence, now wondered if indigenous people ever experienced it. Probably not, as they originated from even further north, he said. They probably felt a sense of relief when they moved further south, though. Who asked the question? Melvin Linton migrated from England to Perth nearly 40 years ago, where he lives with his wife and children. Darwin and the Top End always had legendary status, he said. Australia is full of cliches, but going tropo and its reference to Darwin was one of the first and strongest images I still retain. Mr. Linton worked with the Zero for 37 years, and in his spare time is a keen bushwalker, birdwatcher and golfer. I have a question you'd like answered. This story came from an audience question. Submit yours below and we just might answer it in a future Curious Darwin investigation. Which of these three questions should an ABC reporter investigate this month? Why doesn't Darwin have stinger nets at the beach so people can swim? How did the street and suburb names of Darwin get chosen? And in particular who decided that Dickward Drive would lead to Fanny Bay? Are there really secret tunnels under the city apart from the ones on display? Powered by Harkin Contact Information will be in touch if we find an answer to your question. Name email address phone number. Optional I would like to stay anonymous submit powered by Harkin print email Facebook Twitter.